Section 12 of A Budget of Christmas Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Lufer. The Chimes by Charles Dickens. First Quarter. There are not many people, and as it is desirable that a story-teller and a story-reader should establish a mutual understanding as soon as possible, I beg it to be noticed that I confine this observation neither to young people nor to little people, but extend it to all conditions of people, little and big, young and old, yet growing up or already growing down again. There are not, I say, many people who would care to sleep in a church. I don't mean at sermon time in warm weather, when the thing has actually been done once or twice, but in the night, and alone. A great multitude of persons will be violently astonished, I know, by this position in the broad, bold day, but it applies to night. It must be argued by night, and I will undertake to maintain it successfully on any gusty winter's night appointed for the purpose, with any one opponent chosen from the rest, who will meet me singly in an old churchyard, before an old church door, and will previously empower me to lock him in, if needful to his satisfaction, until morning. For the night wind has a dismal trick of wandering round and round of building of that sort, and moaning as it goes, and of trying with its unseen hand the windows and the doors, and seeking out some crevices by which to enter. And when it has got in, as one not finding what it seeks, whatever that may be, it wails and howls to issue forth again, and, not content with stalking through the aisles and gliding round and round the pillars and tempting the deep organ, soars up to the roof and strives to rend the rafters, then flings itself despairingly upon the stones below and passes muttering into the vaults. Ah, oh, heaven preserve us, sitting snugly round the fire. It has an awful voice, that wind at midnight, singing in a church. But, high up in the steeple, there the foul blast roars and whistles, high up in the steeple, where it is free to come and go through many an airy arch and loophole, and to twist and twine itself about the giddy stair, and twirl the groaning weathercock, and make the very tower shake and shiver. High up in the steeple of an old church, far above the light and murmur of the town, and far below the flying clouds that shadow it, is the wild and dreary place at night. And, high up in the steeple of an old church, dwelt the chimes I tell of. They were old chimes, trust me. Centuries ago these bells had been baptized by bishops, so many centuries ago that the register of their baptism was lost long, long before the memory of man, and no one knew their names. They had had their godfathers and godmothers, these bells. For my part, by the way, I would rather incur the responsibility of being godfather to a bell than a boy. And had had their silver mugs, no doubt, besides. But time had mowed down their sponsors, and Henry the Eighth had melted down their mugs, and now they hung, nameless and mugless, in the church tower. Not speechless, though. Far from it. They had clear, loud, lusty-sounding voices, had these bells, and far and wide they might be heard upon the wind. Much too sturdy chimes were they to be dependent on the pleasure of the wind, moreover. For, fighting gallantly against it when it took an adverse whim, they would pour their cheerful notes into a listening ear right royally, and, bent on being heard on stormy nights by some poor mother watching a sick child, or some lone wife whose husband was at sea, they had sometimes been known to beat a blustering nor'wester, I all to fits, as Toby Veck said. For, though they chose to call him Trotty Veck, his name 
was Toby, and nobody could make it anything else either, except Tobias, he having been as lawfully christened in his day as the bells had been in theirs, though with not quite so much of solemnity or public rejoicing. For my part, I confess myself of Toby Veck's belief, for I am sure he had opportunities enough of forming a correct one, and whatever Toby Veck said, I say, and I take my stand by Toby Veck, although he did stand all day long, and weary work it was, just outside the church door. In fact, he was a ticket porter, Toby Veck, and waited there for jobs and a breezy, goose-skinned, blue-nosed, red-eyed, stony-toed, tooth-chattering place it was to wait in in the winter-time, as Toby Veck well knew. The wind came tearing round the corner, especially the east wind, as if it had sallied forth express from the confines of the earth to have a blow at Toby, and oftentimes it seemed to come upon him sooner than it had expected, for, bouncing round the corner and passing Toby, it would suddenly wheel round again, as if it cried, Why, here he is! Toby was curious about the bells, because there were points of resemblance between them and him. They hung there in all weathers, with the wind and rain driving in upon them, facing only the outsides of all the houses, never getting any nearer to the blazing fires that gleamed and shone upon the windows, or came puffing out of the chimney-tops, and incapable of participating in any of the good things that were constantly being handed through the street doors and iron railings to prodigious cooks. Being but a simple man, he invested the bells with a strange and solemn character. They were so mysterious, often heard and never seen, so high up, so far off, so full of such a deep, strong melody, that he regarded them with a species of awe. And sometimes, when he looked up at the dark, arched windows in the tower, he half expected to be beckoned to by something which was not a bell, and yet was what he heard so often sounding in the chimes. For all this, Toby scouted with indignation a certain flying rumour that the chimes were haunted, as implying the possibility of their being connected with any evil thing. In short, they were very often in his ears, and very often in his thoughts, but always in his good opinion, and he very often got such a crick in his neck by staring with his mouth wide open at the steeple where they hung, that he was fain to take an extra trot or two afterward to cure it. The very thing he was in the act of doing, one cold day, when the last drowsy sound of twelve o'clock, just struck, was humming like a melodious monster of a bee, and not by any means a busy bee, all through the steeple. "'Dinner time, eh?' said Toby, trotting up and down before the church. "'Ah!' Oh. Toby's nose was very red, and his eyelids were very red, and he winked very much, and his shoulders were very near his ears, and his legs were very stiff, and altogether he was evidently a long way upon the frosty side of cool. "'Dinner time, eh?' repeated Toby, using his right hand muffler like an infantine boxing glove and punishing his chest for being cold. Oh! He took a silent trot after that, for a minute or two. "'There's nothing,' said Toby, "'more regular in its coming round than dinner-time, and nothing less regular in its coming round than dinner. That's the great difference between them. It's took me a long time to find it out. I wonder whether it would be worth any gentleman's while now to buy that observation for the papers, or the Parliament.' Toby was only joking, for he gravely shook his head in self-depreciation. "'Why, Lord,' said Toby, "'the papers is full of observations as it is, and so's the Parliament. Here's last week's paper now!' Taking a very dirty one from his pocket, and holding it from him at arm's length. "'Full of observations, full of observations. I like to know the news as well as any man.' said Toby slowly. 
folding it a little smaller and putting it in his pocket again. "'But it almost goes against the grain with me to read a paper now. It frightens me almost. I don't know what we poor people are coming to. Lord sin, we may be coming to something better in the new year nigh upon us.' "'Why, father, father!' said a pleasant voice hard by. But Toby, not hearing it, continued to trot backward and forward, musing as he went and talking to himself. "'It seems as if we can't go right, or do right, or be righted,' said Toby. "'I hadn't much schooling myself when I was young, and I can't make out whether we have any business on the face of the earth or not. Sometimes I think we must have, a little, and sometimes I think we must be intruding. I get so puzzled up sometimes that I'm not even able to make up my mind whether there's any good in us at all, or whether we're born bad. We seem to do dreadful things. We seem to give a deal of trouble. We're always being complained of and guarded against. One way or another we fill the papers. Talk of a new year said Toby mournfully. Why, well, I can bear up as well as another man at most times, better than a good many, for I'm as strong as a lion, and all men ant. But supposing it should really be that we have no right to a new year, supposing we really are intruding. Why, father, father, said the pleasant voice again. Toby heard it this time, started, stopped, and shortening his sight, which had been directed a long way off as seeking for enlightenment in the very heart of the approaching year, found himself face to face with his own child, and looking close into her eyes. Bright eyes they were, eyes that would bear a world of looking in before their depth was fathomed. Dark eyes that reflected back the eyes which searched them, not flashingly or at the owner's will, but with a clear, calm, honest, patient radiance, claiming kindred with that light which heaven called into being, eyes that were beautiful and true, and beaming with hope, with hope so young and fresh, with hope so buoyant, vigorous and bright, despite the twenty years of work and poverty on which they had looked, that they became a voice to Trotty Vect, and said, I think we have some business here. A little. Trotty kissed the lips belonging to the eyes, and squeezed the blooming face between his hands. "'Why, pet,' said Trotty, "'what's to do? Oh, I didn't expect you to-day, Meg.' "'Neither did I expect to come, father,' cried the girl, nodding her head and smiling as she spoke. "'But here I am, and not alone, not alone.' "'Why, you don't mean to say—' observed Trotty, looking curiously at a covered basket which she carried in her hand, that you... Smell it, father dear, said Meg. Only smell it. Trotty was going to lift up the cover at once, in a great hurry, when she gaily interposed her hand. No, 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 said Meg, with the glee of a child. Lengthen it out a little. Let me just lift up the corner. Just the little tiny corner, you know, said Meg suiting the action to the word with the utmost gentleness, and speaking very softly, as if she were afraid of being overheard by something inside the basket. There, now, what's that? Toby took the shortest possible sniff at the edge of the basket, and cried out in a rapture, Why, it's hot! It's burning hot, cried Meg. Ha, 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 it's scalding hot! Ho, 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 roared Toby, with a sort of kick. It's scalding hot. But what is it, father? said Meg. Come, you haven't guessed what it is, and you must guess what it is. I can't think of taking it out till you guess what it is. Don't be in such a hurry. Wait a minute. A little bit more of the cover. Now guess. Meg was in a perfect fright, lest he should guess right too soon. Shrinking away, she held the basket toward him, curling up her pretty shoulders, stopping her ear with her hand as if, by doing so, she could keep the right word out of Toby's lips, and laughing softly the whole time. Meanwhile, Toby, putting a hand on each knee, 
bent down his nose to the basket, and took a long inspiration at the lid. The grin upon his withered face expanded in the process, as if he were inhaling laughing gas. "'Oh, it's very nice,' said Toby. "'It ain't—' "'I suppose it ain't Polonies?' "'No, no, no!' cried Meg, delighted. "'Nothing like Polonies!' "'No,' said Toby, after another sniff. "'It's—it's it's mellower than Polonies. "'It's very nice. It improves every moment. "'It's too decided for trotters, ain't it?' Meg was in an ecstasy. He could not have gone wider of the mark than Trotter's, except Polony's. Liver, said Toby, communing with himself. No, there's a mildness about it that don't answer to liver. Petty toes. No, it aren't faint enough for petty toes. It wants the stringiness of cock's heads, and I know it ain't sausages. I'll tell you what it is. It's chitterlings cried Meg, in a burst of delight. No, it aren't. Why, what am I thinking of? said Toby, suddenly recovering a position as near the perpendicular as it was possible for him to assume. I shall forget my own name next. It's Tripe. Tripe it was. And Meg, in high joy, protested he should say, in a half minute more, it was the best tripe ever stewed. And so, said Meg, busying herself exultingly with her basket. "'I'll lay the cloth at once, father, for I have brought the tripe in a basin, and tied the basin up in a pocket-handkerchief. And if I like to be proud for once, and spread that for a cloth, and call it a cloth, there's no law to prevent me, is there, father?' "'Not that I know of, my dear,' said Toby. "'But they're always bringing up some new law or other.' "'And according to what I was reading in the paper the other day, father, "'why, the judge said, you know, we poor people are supposed to know them all. "'Ho, <laughs> ho, what a mistake! My goodness, how clever they think us!' "'Yes, my dear,' cried Trotty, "'and they'd be very fond of any one of us that did know them all. "'He'd grow fat upon the work he'd get that man, "'and be popular with the gentlefolks in his neighbourhood. "'Very much so.' "'He'd eat his dinner with an appetite, whoever he was, if it smelt like this,' said Meg cheerfully. "'My guest, for there's a potato besides. "'Where will you dine, father? On the post or on the steps? "'Dear, dear, how grand we are! Two places to choose from!' "'The steps to-day, my pet,' said Trotty. "'Steps in dry weather, post in wet. "'There's a great conveniency in the steps at all times.' because of the sitting down, but they're rheumatic in the damp. Then ear, said Meg, clapping her hands after a moment's bustle. Here it is, all ready, and beautiful it looks. Come, father, eat it while it's hot. Come. Since his discovery of the contents of the basket, Trotty had been standing looking at her, and had been speaking, too, in an abstracted manner, which showed that though she was the object of his thoughts and eyes, to the exclusion even of tripe, he neither saw nor thought about her as she was at that moment, but had before him some imaginary rough sketch or drama of her future life. Roused now by her cheerful summons, he shook off a melancholy shake of the head which was just coming upon him, and trotted to her side. As he was stooping to sit down, the chimes rang. "'Amen,' said Trotty, pulling off his hat and looking up toward them. "'Amen to the bells, father,' cried Meg. "'They broke in like a grace, my dear,' said Trotty, taking a seat. "'They'd say a good one, I am sure, if they could. Many's the kind thing they say to me.' "'The bells do, father,' laughed Meg, as she set the basin and a knife and fork before him. "'Well!' "'Seem to, my pet,' said Trotty falling, too, with great vigour. And where's the difference? If I hear em, what does it matter whether they speak it or not? Why, bless you, my dear, said Toby, pointing at the tower with his fork, and becoming more animated under the influence of dinner. How often have I heard them bell say, Toby Veck, Toby Veck, keep a good heart, Toby, Toby Veck, Toby Veck, keep a good heart, Toby, a million times more. "'Well, I never!' cried Meg. 
She had, though, over and over again, for it was Toby's constant topic. "'When things is very bad,' said Trotty, "'very bad indeed, I mean, almost at the worst, then it's Toby Veck, Toby Veck, job coming soon, Toby, Toby Veck, Toby Veck, job coming soon, Toby, that way.' "'And it comes, at last, father,' said Meg, with a touch of sadness in her pleasant voice. "'Always,' answered the unconscious Toby. "'Never fails.' While this discourse was holding, Trotty made no pause in his attack upon the savoury meat before him, but cut and ate, and cut and drank, and cut and chewed, and dodged about from tripe to hot potato, and from hot potato back again to tripe, with an unctuous and unflagging relish. But, happening now to look all around the street, in case anybody should be beckoning from a door or window for a porter, his eyes, in coming back again, encountered Meg, sitting opposite to him with her arms folded, and only busy in watching his progress with a smile of happiness. "'Why, Lord forgive me,' said Trotty, dropping his knife and fork. "'My love, Meg, why didn't you tell me what a beast I was?' "'Father, sitting here?' said Trotty, in penitent explanation, cramming and stuffing and gorging myself, and you there before me, never so much as breaking your precious fast, nor wanting to when— But I have broken it, father, interposed his daughter, laughing. All to bits I have had my dinner. Nonsense, said Trotty. Two dinners in one day? It ain't possible. You might as well tell me that two New Year's days will come together, or that I've had a gold head all my life and never changed it. I have had my dinner, father, for all that, said Meg, coming nearer to him. And if you'll go on with yours, I'll tell you how and where, and how your dinner came to be brought, and something else besides. Toby still appeared incredulous, but she looked into his face with her clear eyes, and laying her hand upon his shoulder, motioned him to go on while the meat was hot. So Trotty took up his knife and fork again and went to work, but much more slowly than before, and shaking his head as if he were not at all pleased with himself. "'I had my dinner, father,' said Meg, after a little hesitation. "'With—with with Richard. His dinner time was early, and as he brought his dinner with him when he came to see me, we—we we had it together, father.' Trotty said, "'Oh,' because she waited. "'And Richard says, father,' Meg resumed, then stopped. "'What does Richard say, Meg?' asked Toby. "'Richard says, father.' Another stoppage. "'Richard's a long time saying it,' said Toby. "'He says then, father,' Meg continued, lifting up her eyes at last and speaking in a tremble, but quite plainly. "'Another year is nearly gone, and where is the use of waiting on from year to year, when it's so unlikely we shall ever be better off than we are now? He says we are poor now, father, and we shall be poor then. But we are young now, and years will make us old before we know it. He says that if we wait, people in our condition, until we see our way quite clearly, the way will be a narrow one indeed. The common way. The grave, father. A bolder man than Trotty Veck must needs have drawn upon his boldness largely to deny it. Trotty held his peace. And how odd, father, to grow old and die and think we might have cheered and helped each other. How odd in all our lives to love each other and to grieve apart, to see each other working, changing, growing old and grey. Even if I got the better of it and forgot him, which I never could do, oh, father dear, how odd to have a heart so full as mine is now, and live to have it slowly drained out every drop, without 
the recollection of one happy moment of a woman's life to stay behind and comfort me and make me better trotty sat quite still meg dried her eyes and said more gaily that is to say with here a laugh and there a sob and here a laugh and a sob together so richard says father as his work was yesterday made certain for some time to come and as i love him and have loved him fully three years oh, longer than that if he knew it will i marry him on new year's day the best and the happiest day he says in the whole year and one that is almost sure to bring good fortune with it it's a short notice father isn't it but i haven't my fortune to be settled or my wedding dresses to be made like the great ladies have i father and he said so much and he said it in his way so strong and earnest and all the time so kind and gentle but i said i'd come and talk to you father and as they paid the money for at work of mine this morning unexpectedly i am sure and as you fed very poorly for a whole week and as i couldn't help wishing there should be something to make this day a sort of holiday to you as well as a dear and happy day to me father i made a little treat and brought it to surprise you and see how he leaves it cooling on the step said another voice it was the voice of the same richard who had come upon them unobserved and stood before the father and daughter looking down upon them with a face as glowing as the iron on which his stout sledge-hammer daily rung a handsome well-made powerful youngster he was with eyes that sparkled like red-hot droppings from a furnace fire black hair that curled about his swarthy temples rarely and a smile a smile that bore out meg's eulogium on his style of conversation see how he leaves it cooling on the step said richard meg don't know what he likes not she trotty all action and enthusiasm immediately reached up his hand to richard and was going to address him in a great hurry when the house door opened without any warning and a footman very nearly put his foot in the tripe out of the vase here will you you must always go and be a settin on our steps must you you can't go and give a turn to none of the neighbours never can't you will you clear the road or won't you strictly speaking the last question was irrelevant as they had already done it what's the matter what's the matter said the gentleman for whom the door was opened coming out of the house at that kind of a light heavy pace that peculiar compromise between a walk and a jog-trot with which a gentleman upon the smooth downhill of life wearing creaking boots a watch-chain and clean linen may come out of his house not only without any abatement of his dignity but with an expression of having important and wealthy engagements elsewhere what's the matter what's the matter you're always a bein begged and prayed upon your bended knees you are said the footman with great emphasis to trotty Vec, to let our doorsteps be why don't you let em be can't you let em be there that'll do that'll do said the gentleman hello there porter beckoning with his head to trotty Vec. come here what's that your dinner yes sir said trotty leaving it behind him in a corner don't leave it there exclaimed the gentleman bring it here bring it here so this is your dinner is it yes sir repeated trotty looking with a fixed eye and a watery mouth at the piece of tripe he had reserved for a last delicious titbit which the gentleman was now turning over and over on the end of a fork two other gentlemen had come out with him one was a low-spirited gentleman of middle age of a meagre habit and a disconsolate face who kept his hands continually in the pockets of his scanty pepper-and-salt trousers very large and dog-eared from that custom and was not particularly well brushed or washed the other a full-sized sleek well-conditioned gentleman in a blue coat with bright buttons and a white cravat this gentleman had a very red face as if an undue proportion of the blood in his body were squeezed up into his head which perhaps accounted for his having also the appearance of being 
rather cold about the heart. He who had Toby's meat upon the fork called to the first one by the name of Filer, and they both drew near together. Mr. Filer, being exceedingly short-sighted, was obliged to get so close to the remnant of Toby's dinner before he could make out what it was, that Toby's heart leaped up into his mouth, but Mr. Filer didn't eat it. "'This is a description of animal food, Alderman,' said Filer, making little punches in it with a pencil-case. "'Commonly known to the labouring population of this country by the name of tripe.' The alderman laughed and winked, for he was a merry fellow, alderman cute. Oh, and a sly fellow, too, a knowing fellow, up to everything, not to be imposed upon, deep in the people's hearts. He knew them, cute did, I believe you. "'But who eats tripe?' said Mr. Filer, looking round. "'Tripe is without an exception.' the least economical and the most wasteful article of consumption that the markets of this country can by possibility produce. The loss upon a pound of tripe has been found to be, in the boiling, seven-eighths of a fifth more than the loss upon a pound of any other animal substance whatever. Tripe is more expensive, properly understood, than the hothouse pineapple. Taking into account the number of animals slaughtered yearly within the bills of mortality alone, and forming a low estimate of the quantity of tripe which the carcasses of these animals, reasonably well butchered, would yield, I find that the waste on that amount of tripe, if boiled, would fiddle a garrison of five hundred men for five months of thirty-one days each and a February over. The waste! The waste! Trotty stood aghast, and his legs shook under him. He seemed to have starved a garrison of five hundred men with his own hand. "'Who eats tripe?' said Mr. Filer warmly. "'Who eats tripe?' Trotty made a miserable bow. "'You do, do you?' said Mr. Filer. "'Then I'll tell you something. You snatch your tripe, my friend, out of the mouths of widows and orphans.' "'I hope not, sir,' said Trotty faintly. "'I'd sooner die of want.' "'Divide the amount of tripe before mentioned, Alderman,' said Mr. Filer, "'by the estimated number of existing widows and orphans, "'and the result will be one penny weight of tripe to each. "'Not a grain is left for that man. "'Consequently, he's a robber.' Trotty was so shocked that it gave him no concern to see the alderman finish the tripe himself. It was a relief to get rid of it, anyhow. And "'What do you say?' asked the alderman jocosely, of the red-faced gentleman in the blue coat. "'You have heard, friend Filer. What do you say?' "'What's it possible to say?' returned the gentleman. "'What is to be said? Who can take any interest in a fellow like this?' Meaning Trotty. In such degenerate times as these. Look at him. What an object. The good old times, the grand old times, the great old times. Those were the times for a bold peasantry, and all that sort of thing. Those were the times for every sort of thing, in fact. There's nothing nowadays. Ah, sighed the red-faced gentleman. The good old times, the good old times. It is possible that poor Trotty's faith in these very vague old times was not entirely destroyed, for he felt vague enough at the moment. One thing, however, was plain to him in the midst of his distress, to wit, that, however these gentlemen might differ in their details, his misgivings of that morning, and of many other mornings, were well founded. "'No, no!' "'We can't go right or do right,' thought Trotty in despair. "'There is no good in us. We are born bad.' But Trotty had a father's heart within him, which had somehow got into his breast in spite of this decree, and he could not bear that Meg, in the blush of her brief joy, should have her fortune read by these wise gentlemen. "'God help her,' thought poor Trotty, she will know it soon enough. 
he anxiously signed therefore to the young smith to take her away but he was so busy talking to her softly at a little distance that he only became conscious of this desire simultaneously with alderman cute now the alderman had not yet had his say but he was a philosopher too practical though oh very practical and as he had no idea of losing any portion of his audience he cried stop trotty took meg's hand and drew it through his arm he didn't seem to know what he was doing though your daughter eh said the alderman chucking her familiarly under the chin and you're making love to her are you said cute to the young smith yes returned richard quickly for he was nettled by the question and we are going to be married on new year's day what do you mean cried filer sharply married why well, yes we were thinking of it master said richard we are rather in a hurry you see in case it should be put down first oh cried filer with a groan put that down indeed alderman and you'll do something married married the ignorance of the first principles of political economy on the part of these people their improvidence their wickedness is by heavens enough to now look at that couple will you well they were worth looking at and marriage seemed as reasonable and fair a deed as they need have in contemplation a man may live to be as old as methuselah said mr filer and may labour all his life for the benefit of such people as those and may heap up facts on figures facts on figures facts on figures mountains high and dry and he can no more hope to persuade em that they have no right or business to be married than he can hope to persuade em that they have no earthly right or business to be born and that we know they haven't we reduced that to a mathematical certainty long ago come here my girl said alderman cute the young blood of her lover had been mounting wrathfully within the last few minutes and he was indisposed to let her come but setting a constraint upon himself he came forward with a stride as meg approached and stood beside her trotty kept her hand within his arm still but looked from face to face as wildly as a sleeper in a dream no i'm going to give you a word or two of good advice my girl said the alderman in his nice easy way it's my place to give advice you know because i'm a justice you know i'm a justice don't you meg timidly said yes but everybody knew alderman cute was a justice oh dear so active a justice always who such a mote of brightness in the public eye as cute you are going to be married you say pursued the alderman very unbecoming and indelicate in one of your sex but never mind that after you're married you'll quarrel with your husband and come to be a distressed wife you may think not but you will because i tell you so now i give you fair warning that i have made up my mind to put distressed wives down so don't be brought before me you'll have children boys those boys will grow up bad of course and run wild in the streets without shoes or stockings mind my young friend i'll convict them summarily every one for i am determined to put boys without shoes or stockings down perhaps your husband will die young most likely and leave you with a baby then you'll be turned out of doors and wander up and down the streets now don't wander near me my dear for I am resolved to put all wandering mothers down, all young mothers, of all sorts and kinds. It's my determination to put down. Don't think to plead illness as an excuse with me, or babies as an excuse with me, for all sick persons and young children. I hope you know the church service, but I'm afraid not. I am determined to put down. And if you attempt desperately and ungratefully and impiously and fraudulently attempt to drown yourself or hang yourself i'll have no pity on you for i have made up my mind to put all suicide down if there is one thing 
said the alderman with his self-satisfied smile, on which I can be said to have made up my mind more than on another, it is to put suicide down. So don't try it on. That's the phrase, isn't it? Ha ha! Now we understand each other. Toby knew not whether to be agonized or glad to see that Meg had turned deadly white and dropped her lover's hand. As for you, you dull dog, said the alderman, turning with even increased cheerfulness and urbanity to the young smith. What are you thinking of being married for? What do you want to be married for, you silly fellow? If I was a fine young strapping chap like you, I should be ashamed of being milksop enough to pin myself to a woman's apron strings. Why, she'll be an old woman before you're a middle-aged man, and a pretty figure you'll cut then, with a draggle-tailed wife and a crowd of squalling children crying after you wherever you go. Oh, he knew how to banter the common people, Alderman Cute. There, go along with you, said the Alderman, and repent. Don't make such a fool of yourself as to get married on New Year's Day. You'll think very differently of it long before next New Year's Day. A trim young fellow like you, with all the girls looking after you. There, go along with you. They went along, not arm in arm, or hand in hand, or interchanging bright glances, but she in tears, he gloomy and down-looking. Were these the hearts that had so lately made old Toby's leap up from its faintness? No, no. The alderman, a blessing on his head, had put them down. As you happen to be here, said the alderman to Toby, you shall carry a letter for me. Can you be quick? You're an old man. Toby, who had been looking after Meg quite stupidly, made shift to murmur out that he was very quick and very strong. How old are you? inquired the alderman. I am over sixty, sir, said Toby. Oh, this man's a great deal past the average age, you know, cried Mr. Filer, breaking in as if his patience would bear some trying, but this was really carrying matters a little too far. I feel I'm intruding, sir said Toby. I, I misdoubted it this morning. Oh, dear me. The alderman cut him short by giving him the letter from his pocket. Toby would have got a shilling, too, but Mr. Filer, clearly showing that in that case he would rob a certain given number of persons of nine pence half penny apiece, he only got sixpence, and thought himself very well off to get that. Then the alderman gave an arm to each of his friends, and walked off in high feather, but he immediately came hurrying back alone as if he had forgotten something. Porter, said the alderman. Sir, said Toby. Take care of that daughter of yours. She's much too handsome. Even her good looks are stolen from somebody or other, I suppose, thought Toby, looking at the sixpence in his hand and thinking of the tripe. She's been in Rob five hundred ladies of bloom apiece, I shouldn't wonder. It's very dreadful. She's much too handsome, my man, repeated the alderman. The chances are that she'll come to no good, I clearly see. Observe what I say. Take care of her. With which he hurried off again. Wrong every way, wrong every way, said Trotty, clasping his hands. Born bad, no business here. The chimes came clashing in upon him as he said the last words, full, loud, and sounding, but with no encouragement, no, not a drop. "'The tune's changed!' cried the old man as he listened. "'There's not a word of all that fancy in it. Why should there be? I have no business with the new year, nor with the old one neither. Let me die!' Still the bells, pealing forth their changes, made the very air spin. Put em down, put em down, good old times, good old times, facts and figures, facts and figures, put em down, put em down. If they said anything, they said this, until the brain of Toby reeled. 
he pressed his bewildered head between his hands as if to keep it from splitting asunder. A well-timed action, as it happened, for finding the letter in one of them, and being by that means reminded of his charge, he fell, mechanically, into his usual trot, and trotted off. End of Section 12 First Quarter of The Chimes Section 13 of A Budget of Christmas Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Looper The Chimes by Charles Dickens Second Quarter The letter Toby had received from Alderman Cute was addressed to a great man in the great district of the town. The greatest district of the town. It must have been the greatest district of the town because it was commonly called the world by its inhabitants. The year was old that day. The patient year had lived through the reproaches and misuses of its slanderers, and faithfully performed its work. Spring, summer, autumn, winter. It had labored through the destined round, and now laid down its weary head to die. Trotty had no portion, to his thinking, in the new year or the old. Put em down, put em down, facts and figures, facts and figures, good old times, good old times, put em down, put em down. His trot went to that measure, and would fit itself to nothing else. But even that one, melancholy as it was, brought him, in due time, to the end of his journey, to the mansion of Sir Joseph Bowley, Member of Parliament. The door was opened by a porter. Such a porter! Not of Toby's order. Quite another thing. His place was the ticket, though, not Toby's. This porter underwent some hard panting before he could speak, having breathed himself by coming incautiously out of his chair, without first taking time to think about it and compose his mind. When he had found his voice, which it took him some time to do, for it was a long way off and hidden under a load of meat, he said, in a fat whisper, "'Who's it from?' Toby told him. "'You're to take it in yourself,' said the porter, pointing to a room at the end of a long passage, opening from the hall. "'Everything goes straight in on this day of the year. You're not a bit too soon, for the carriage is at the door now, and they have only come to town for a couple of hours a purpose.' Toby wiped his feet, which were quite dry already, with great care, and took the way pointed out to him, observing as he went that it was an awfully grand house, but hushed and covered up, as if the family were in the country. Knocking at the room door, he was told to enter from within, and doing so, found himself in a spacious library, where, at a table strewn with files and papers, were a stately lady in a bonnet, and a not very stately gentleman in black, who wrote from her dictation, while another, and an older, and a much statelier gentleman, whose hat and cane were on the table, walked up and down, with one hand in his breast, and looked complacently, from time to time, at his own picture, a full length, a very full length, hanging over the fireplace. "'What is this?' said the last-named gentleman. "'Mr. Fish, will you have the goodness to attend?' Mr. Fish begged pardon, and, taking the letter from Toby, handed it with great respect. "'From Alderman Cute, Sir Joseph.' "'Is this all? Have you nothing else, Porter?' inquired Sir Joseph. Toby replied in the negative. "'You have no bill or demand upon me. My name is Bowley, Sir Joseph Bowley. Of any kind, from anybody, have you?' said Sir Joseph. "'If you have, present it.' There is a check-book by the side of Mr. Fish. I allow nothing to be carried into the new year. Every description of account is settled in this house at the close of the old one, so that if death was to... to... To cut, suggested Mr. Fish. 
to sever sir returned sir joseph with great asperity the cord of existence my affairs would be found i hope in a state of preparation my dear sir joseph said the lady who was greatly younger than the gentleman how shocking my lady bowley returned sir joseph floundering now and then as in the great depth of his observations at this season of the year we should think of of ourselves we should look into our our accounts we should feel that every return of so eventful a period in human transactions involves matter of deep moment between a man and his and his banker sir joseph delivered these words as if he felt the full morality of what he was saying and desired that even trotty should have an opportunity of being improved by such discourse possibly he had this end before him in still forbearing to break the seal of the letter and in telling trotty to wait where he was a minute i am the poor man's friend observed sir joseph glancing at the poor man present as such i may be taunted as such i have been taunted but i ask no other title bless him for a noble gentleman thought trotty i don't agree with cute here for instance said sir joseph holding out the letter i don't agree with that filer party i don't agree with any party my friend the poor man has no business with anything of that sort and nothing of that sort has any business with him my friend the poor man in my district is my business no man or body of men has any right to interfere between my friend and me that is the ground i take i assume a, a paternal character toward my friend i say my good fellow i will treat you paternally with that great sentiment he opened the alderman's letter and read it very polite and attentive i am sure exclaimed sir joseph my lady the alderman is so obliging as to remind me that he has had the distinguished honour he is very good of meeting me at the house of our mutual friend deedles the banker and he does me the favour to inquire whether it will be agreeable to me to have will fern put down he came up to london it seems to look for employment trying to better himself that's his story and being found at night asleep in a shed was taken into custody and carried next morning before the alderman the alderman observes very properly that he is determined to put this sort of thing down and that if it will be agreeable to me to have will fern put down he will be happy to begin with him let him be made an example of by all means returned the lady last winter when i introduced pinking and eyelet holing among the men and boys in the village as a nice evening employment and had the lines oh let us love our occupations bless the squire and his relations live upon our daily rations and always know our proper stations set to music on the new system for them to sing the while this very fern i see him now touched that hat of his and said i humbly ask for your pardon my lady but ain't i something different from a great girl i expected it of course who can expect anything but insolence and ingratitude from that class of people that is not to the purpose however sir joseph make an example of him trotty who had long ago relapsed and was very low-spirited stepped forward with a rueful face to take the letter sir joseph held out to him you have heard perhaps said sir joseph oracularly certain remarks into which i have been led respecting the solemn period of time at which we have arrived and the duty imposed upon us of settling our affairs and being prepared now my friend can you lay your hand upon your heart and say that you also have made preparation for a new year 
"'I am afraid, sir,' stammered Trotty, looking meekly at him, "'that I am a, a little behind-hand with the world.' "'Behind-hand with the world?' repeated Sir Joseph Bowley, in a tone of terrible distinctness. "'I am afraid, sir,' faltered Trotty, "'that there's a matter of ten or twelve shillings owing to Mrs. Chickenstalker.' "'To Mrs. Chickenstalker?' repeated Sir Joseph, in the same tone as before. "'A shop, sir,' exclaimed Toby, "'in the general line. Also a a little money on account of rent. A very little, sir. It oughtn't to be owing, I know, but we have been hard put to indeed. Sir Joseph looked at his lady, and at Mr. Fish, and at Trotty, one after another, twice all round. He then made a despondent gesture with both hands at once, as if he gave the thing up altogether. How a man— even among this improvident and impracticable race, an old man, a man grown grey, can look a new year in the face with his affairs in this condition. How he can lie down in his bed at night and get up again in the morning, and— oh, There, he said, turning his back on Trotty. Take the letter, take the letter. I heartily wish it was otherwise, sir said Trotty, anxious to excuse himself. "'We have been tried very hard.' Sir Joseph, still repeating, "'Take the letter, take the letter,' and Mr. Fish not only saying the same thing, but giving additional force to the request by motioning the bearer to the door, he had nothing for it but to make his bow and leave the house. And in the street poor Trotty pulled his worn hat down on his head to hide the grief he felt at getting no hold on the new year anywhere. He didn't even lift his hat to look up at the bell-tower when he came to the old church on his return. He halted there a moment from habit, and knew that it was growing dark, and that the steeple rose above him, indistinct and faint in the murky air. He knew, too, that the chimes would ring immediately, and that they sounded to his fancy at such a time, like voices in the clouds. But he only made the more haste to deliver the alderman's letter, and to get out of the way before they began, for he dreaded to hear them tagging, friends and fathers, friends and fathers, to the burden they had rung out last. Toby discharged himself of his commission, therefore, with all possible speed, and set off trotting homeward. But what with his pace, which was at best an awkward one in the street, and what with his hat, which didn't improve it, he trotted against somebody in less than no time, and was sent staggering out into the road. "'I beg your pardon, I'm sure,' said Trotty, pulling up his hat in great confusion, and, between the hat and the torn lining, fixing his head into a kind of beehive. "'I hope I haven't hurt you.' "'As to hurting anybody,' Toby was not such an absolute Samson, but that he was much more likely to be hurt himself, and, indeed, he had flown out into the road like a shuttlecock. He had such an opinion of his own strength, however, that he was in real concern for the other party, and said again, "'I hope I haven't hurt you.' The man against whom he had run, a sun-browned, sinewy, country-looking man, with grizzled hair and a rough chin, stared at him for a moment as if he suspected him to be in jest. But, satisfied of his good faith, he answered, "'No, friend, you have not hurt me.' "'Nor the child, I hope,' said Trotty. "'Nor the child,' returned the man. "'I thank you kindly.' As he said so, he glanced at a little girl he carried in his arms, asleep, and shading her face with the long end of the poor handkerchief he wore about his throat, went slowly on. The tone in which he said, I thank you kindly, penetrated Trotty's heart. He was so jaded and footsore, and so soiled with travel, and looked about him so forlorn and strange, that it was a comfort to him to be able to thank anyone, no matter for how little. Toby stood 
gazing after him as he plodded wearily away, with the child's arm clinging round his neck. At the figure in the worn shoes, now the very shade and ghost of shoes, rough leather leggings, common frock and broad slouched hat, Trotty stood gazing, blind to the whole street, and at the child's arm, clinging round its neck. Before he merged into the darkness the traveller stopped, and, looking round and seeing Trotty standing there yet, seemed undecided whether to return or go on. After doing first one and then the other, he came back, and Trotty went half-way to meet him. "'You can tell me, perhaps,' said the man, with a faint smile, "'and if you can, I am sure will, and I'd rather ask you than another, where Alderman Cute lives.' "'Close at hand,' replied Toby. "'I'll show you his house with pleasure.' "'I was to have gone to him elsewhere, to-morrow,' said the man, accompanying Toby, "'but I am uneasy under suspicion, and want to clear myself, and be free to go and seek my bread. I don't know where. So maybe he'll forgive my going to his house to-night.' "'It's impossible,' cried Toby, with a start, "'that your name's Fern?' "'Eh?' cried the other turning on him in astonishment. "'Fern! Will Fern!' said Trotty. "'That's my name,' replied the other. "'Why, then,' cried Trotty, seizing him by the arm and looking cautiously round, "'for heaven's sake don't go to him! Don't go to him! He'll put you down as sure as ever you were born! Here, come up this alley, and we'll tell you what I mean. Don't go to him!' His new acquaintance looked as if he thought him mad, but he bore him company, nevertheless. When they were shrouded from observation, Trotty told him what he knew, and what character he had received, and all about it. The subject of his history listened to it with a calmness that surprised him. He did not contradict or interrupt at once. He nodded his head, now and then, more in corroboration of an old and worn-out story, it appeared, than in refutation of it, and— once or twice threw back his hat and passed his freckled hand over a brow where every furrow he had ploughed seemed to have set its image in a little. But he did no more. "'It's true enough in the main,' he said. "'Master, I could sift grain from the husk here or there, but let it be as tis. What odds? I've gone against his plans, to my misfortune. I can't help it. I should do the like to-morrow.' And as to character, them gentlefolks will search and search and pry and pry, and have it as free from spot or speck in us, before they'll help us to a dry good word. Well, I hope they don't lose good opinion as easy as we do, or their lives is strict indeed, and hardly worth the keeping. For myself, master, I never took with that hand, holding it before him, what wasn't my own, and never held it back from work, however hard or poorly paid, Whoever can deny it, let him chop it off. But when work won't maintain me like a human creature, when my living is so bad that I'm hungry, outdoors and in, when I see a whole working life begin that way, go on that way, and end that way, without a chance or change, then I say to the gentlefolks, keep away from me, let my cottage be. My doors is dark enough without your darkening of a more. Don't look for me to come up into the park and help the show when there's a birthday or a fine speech-making or what not. Act your plays and games without me, and be welcome to em and enjoy em. We've now to do with one another. I'm best let alone. Seeing that the child in his arms had opened her eyes and was looking about in wonder, he checked himself to say a word or two of foolish prattle in her ear and stand her on the ground beside him. Then, slowly winding one of her long tresses round and round his rough forefinger like a ring, while she hung about his dusty leg, he said to Trotty, "'I'm not a cross-grained man by nature, I believe, and easy satisfied, I'm sure. I bear no ill-will against none of em. I only want to live like one of the Almighty's creatures. I can't. I don't. And so there's a pit dug between me and them that can and do.' There's others like me, 
you might tell him off by hundreds and by thousands sooner than by ones. Trotty knew that he spoke the truth in this, and shook his head to signify as much. "'I've got a bad name this way,' said Fern, "'and I'm not likely, I'm afeard, to get a better. "'Tan't lawful to be out of sorts, and I am out of sorts, "'though God knows I'd sooner bear a cheerful spirit if I could. "'Well, I don't know as this alderman could hurt me much by sending me to jail, "'but without a friend to speak a word for me, he might do it. "'And you see,' pointing downward with his finger at the child. He sunk his voice so low, and gazed upon her with an air so stern and strange, that Toby, to divert the current of his thoughts, inquired if his wife were living. "'I never had one,' he returned, shaking his head. "'She's my brother's child, a orphan, nine year old, though you'd hardly think it. But she's tired and worn out now. They'd have taken care on her in the Union, eight and twenty mile away from where we live, between four walls, as they took care of my old father when he couldn't work no more, though he didn't trouble him long. But I took her instead, and she's lived with me ever since. Her mother had a friend once, in London here. We were trying to find her, and to find work too, but it's a large place. Never mind. More room for us to walk about in, Lily. Meeting the child's eyes with a smile, which melted Toby more than tears, he shook him by the hand. "'I don't so much as know your name,' he said. "'But I've opened my heart free to you, for I'm thankful to you, with good reason. I'll take your advice and keep clear of this—' "'Justice,' suggested Toby. "'Oh,' he said, "'if that's the name they give him, this Justice. And tomorrow we'll try whether there's better fortune to be met with somewheres near London. Good night. A happy new year. Stay! cried Trotty, catching at his hand as he relaxed his grip. Stay! The new year never can be happy to me if we part like this. The new year can never be happy to me if I see the child and you go wandering away, you don't know where, without a shelter for your heads. Come home with me. I'm a poor man, living in a poor place, but I can give you lodging for one night, never miss it. Come home with me. Here, I'll take her, cried Trotty, lifting up the child. A pretty one. I'll carry twenty times her weight and never know I'd got it. Tell me if I go too quick for you. I'm very fast. I always was. Trotty said this, taking about six of his trotting paces to one stride of his fatigued companion, and with his thin legs quivering again beneath the load he bore. "'Down the museer, Uncle Will, and step at the black door, with T. Vec Ticket Porter, wrote upon the board. And here we are, and here we go, and here we are indeed, my precious Meg, surprising you!' With which words, Trotty, in a breathless state, set the child down before his daughter in the middle of the floor. The little visitor looked once at Meg, and doubting nothing in that face, but trusting everything she saw there, ran into her arms. "'Here we are, and here we go!' cried Trotty, running round the room and choking audibly. "'Here, Uncle Will, here's a fire you know. Why don't you come to the fire? Oh, here we are, and here we go. Meg, my precious darling, where's the kettle? Here it is, and here it goes, and it'll boil in no time.' Trotty really had picked up the kettle somewhere or other in the course of his wild career, and now put it on the fire, while Meg, seating the child in a warm corner, knelt down on the ground before her, and pulled off her shoes and dried her wet feet on a cloth. Aye, and she laughed at Trotty, too, so pleasantly, so cheerfully, that Trotty could have blessed her where she kneeled, for he had seen that, when they had entered, she was sitting by the fire in tears. "'Why, father,' said Meg, "'you're crazy to-night, I think. "'I don't know what the bells would say to that.' Meg looked toward him, and saw that he had elaborately stationed himself behind the chair of their male visitor, where, with many mysterious gestures, he was holding up the sixpence he had earned. "'I see, my dear,' said Trotty, "'as I was coming in, half an ounce of tea, lying somewhere on the stairs.' "'and I'm pretty sure there was a bit of bacon, too. 
as I don't remember where it was exactly, I'll go myself and try to find them. With this inscrutable artifice, Toby withdrew to purchase the viands he had spoken of for ready money at Mrs. Chickenstalker's, and presently came back, pretending that he had not been able to find them at first in the dark. "'But here they are at last,' said Trotty, setting out the tea-things. "'All cracked. I was pretty sure it was tea in a rasher. So it is. Make my pet, if you'll just make the tea, while your unworthy father toasts the bacon, we shall be ready immediate. It's a curious circumstance, said Trotty, proceeding in his cookery, with the assistance of the toasting fork. Curious, but well known to my friends, that I never care myself for rashers nor for tea. I like to see other people enjoy em, said Trotty, speaking very loud to impress the fact upon his guest. But to me, as food, they are disagreeable. Yet Trotty sniffed the savour of the hissing bacon, ah, as if he liked it, and when he poured the boiling water in the teapot, looked lovingly down into the depths of that snug cauldron, and, suffering the fragrant steam to curl about his nose and wreathe his head and face in the thick cloud. However, for all this, he neither ate nor drank, except at the very beginning, a mere morsel for form's sake, which he appeared to eat with infinite relish, but declared was perfectly uninteresting to him. "'Now I'll tell you what,' said Trotty after tea. "'The little one, she sleeps with Meg, I know.' "'With good Meg,' cried the child, caressing her. "'With Meg.' "'That's right,' said Trotty. "'And I shouldn't wonder if she'll kiss Meg's father, won't she?' "'I'm Meg's father.' Mightily delighted Trotty was, when the child went timidly toward him, and having kissed him, fell back upon Meg again. Meg looked toward their guest, who leaned upon her chair, and, with his face turned from her, fondled the child's head, half hidden in her lap. "'To be sure,' said Toby, "'to be sure. I don't know what I'm rambling on about to-night. My wits are wool-gathering, I think. Will Fern, you come along with me. You're tired to death, and broken down for want of rest. You come along with me." The hand released from the child's hair had fallen, trembling, into Trotty's hand. So Trotty, talking without intermission, led him out as tenderly and easily as if he had been a child himself. Returning before Meg, he listened for an instant at the door of her little chamber, an adjoining room. The child was murmuring a simple prayer before lying down to sleep, and when she had remembered Meg's name, "'Dearly, dearly,' so her words ran, Trotty heard her stop and ask for his. It was some short time before the foolish little old fellow could compose himself to mend the fire and draw his chair to the warm hearth. But when he had done so, and had trimmed the light, he took his newspaper from his pocket and began to read. Carelessly at first, and skimming up and down the columns, but with an earnest and sad attention very soon. For this same dreaded paper redirected Trotty's thoughts into the channel they had taken all that day, and which the day's events had so marked out and shaped. His interest in the two wanderers had set him on another course of thinking, and a happier one for the time. But, being alone again, in reading of the crimes and violences of the people, he relapsed into his former train. "'It's too true, all I've heard to-day,' Toby muttered. "'Too just, too full of proof. We're bad.' The chimes took up the words so suddenly— burst out so loud and clear and sonorous that the bells seemed to strike him in his chair. And what was that, they said? Toby Veck, Toby Veck, waiting for you, Toby. Toby Veck, Toby Veck, waiting for you, Toby. Come and see us, come and see us. Drag him to us, drag him to us. Haunt and hunt him, haunt and hunt him. 
break his slumbers, break his slumbers. Toby Veck, Toby Veck, door open wide, Toby. Toby Veck, Toby Veck, door open wide, Toby. Then fiercely back to their impetuous strain again, and ringing in the very bricks and plaster on the walls. Toby listened. Fancy, fancy his remorse for having run away from them that afternoon. No, no, nothing of the kind. Again and again and yet a dozen times again. Haunt and hunt him, haunt and hunt him, drag him to us, drag him to us, deafening the whole town. Meg, said Trotty softly, tapping at her door, do you hear anything? I hear the bells, father. Surely they're very loud tonight. Is she asleep? said Toby, making an excuse for peeping in. So peacefully and happily. I can't leave her yet, though, father. Look how she holds my hand. Meg, whispered Trotty, listen to the bells. She listened with her face toward him all the time, but it underwent no change. She didn't understand them. Trotty withdrew, resumed his seat by the fire, and once more listened by himself. He remained here a little time. It was impossible to bear it. Their energy was dreadful. If the tower door really is open, said Toby, hastily laying aside his apron, but never thinking of his hat. What's to hinder me from going up in the steeple and satisfying myself? If it's shut, or I don't want any other satisfaction, that's enough. He was pretty certain, as he slipped out quietly into the street, that he should find it shut and locked, for he knew the door well, and had so rarely seen it open, that he couldn't reckon above three times in all. It was a low-arched portal outside the church, in a dark nook behind a column, and had such great iron hinges and such a monstrous lock that there was more hinge and lock than door. But what was his astonishment when, coming bareheaded to the church, and putting his hand into the dark nook with a certain misgiving that it might be unexpectedly seized, and a shivering propensity to draw it back again, he found that the door, which opened outward, actually stood ajar. He thought on the first surprise of going back, or of getting a light or a companion. But his courage aided him immediately, and he determined to ascend alone. "'What have I to fear?' said Trotty. "'It's a church. Besides, the ringers may be there, and have forgotten to shut the door.' So he went in, feeling his way as he went, like a blind man, for it was very dark, and very quiet, for the chimes were silent. The dust from the street had blown into the recess, and lying there, heaped up, made it so soft and velvet-like to the foot, that there was something startling even in that. The narrow stair was so close to the door, too, that he stumbled at the very first, and, shutting the door upon himself by striking it with his foot, and causing it to rebound back heavily, he couldn't open it again. This was another reason, however, for going on. Trotty groped his way and went on. Up, 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 and round and round and up, 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 higher, higher, higher up, until, ascending through the floor and pausing with his head just raised above its beams, he came among the bells. It was barely possible to make out their great shapes in the gloom, but there they were, shadowy and dark and dumb. A heavy sense of dread and loneliness fell instantly upon him as he climbed into this airy nest of stone and metal. His head went round and round. He listened, and then raised a wild, Hello! Hello! was mournfully protracted by the echoes. Giddy! 
confused and out of breath and frightened, Toby looked about him vacantly and sunk down in a swoon. End of Section 13 Second Quarter of the Chimes Section 14 of A Budget of Christmas Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Lufer. The Chimes by Charles Dickens. Third Quarter. When and how the darkness of the night black steeple changed to shining light, and how the solitary tower was peopled with a myriad figures, when and how the whispered haunt and hunt him, breathing monotonously through his sleep or swoon, became a voice exclaiming in the waking ears of Trotty, Break his slumbers. When and how he ceased to have a sluggish and confused idea that such things were, companioning a host of others that were not, there are no dates or means to tell. But, awake, and standing on his feet upon the boards where he had lately lain, he saw this goblin sight. Then, and not before, did Trotty see in every bell a bearded figure of the bulk and stature of the bell. Incomprehensibly, a figure and the bell itself. Gigantic, grave, and darkly watchful of him, as he stood rooted to the ground. Mysterious and awful figures, resting on nothing, poised in the night air of the tower, with their draped and hooded heads merged in the dim roof, motionless and shadowy, shadowy and dark, although he saw them by some light belonging to themselves. None else was there, each with its muffled hand upon its goblin mouth. He could not plunge down wildly through the opening in the floor, for all power of motion had deserted him. Otherwise he would have done so. I would have thrown himself head foremost from the steeple-top, rather than have seen them, watching him, with eyes that would have waked and watched, although the pupils had been taken out. A blast of air, how cold and shrill, came moaning through the tower. As it died away, the great bell, or the goblin of the great bell, spoke. "'What visitor is this?' it said. The voice was low and deep, and Trotty fancied that it sounded in the other figures as well. "'I—I I thought my name was called by the chimes,' said Trotty, raising his hands in an attitude of supplication. "'I hardly know why I am here, or how I came. I have listened to the chimes these many years. They have cheered me often.' "'And you have thanked them?' said the bell. "'A thousand times!' cried Trotty. "'How?' "'I, I am a poor man,' faltered Trotty, "'and could only thank them in words.' "'And always so?' inquired the goblin of the bell. "'Have you never done us wrong in words?' "'No!' cried Trotty eagerly. "'Never done us foul and false and wicked wrong in words,' pursued the goblin of the bell. Trotty was about to answer, "'Never!' but he stopped and was confused. "'The voice of time,' said the phantom, "'cries to man, advance. Time is for his advancement.' and improvement, for his greater worth, his greater happiness, his better life, his progress onward to that goal within its knowledge and its view, and set there in the period when time and he began. Ages of darkness, wickedness, and violence have come and gone. Millions, uncountable, have suffered, lived, and died to point the way before him, 
who seeks to turn him back or stay him in his course arrests a mighty engine which will strike the meddler dead and be the fiercer and the wilder ever for its momentary check i never did so to my knowledge sir said trotty it was quite by accident if i did i wouldn't go to do it i'm sure who puts into the mouth of time or of its servants said the goblin of the bell a cry of lamentation for days which have had their trial and their failure and have left deep traces of it which the blind may see a cry that only serves to present time by showing men how much it needs their help when any ears can listen to regrets for such a past who does this does a wrong and you have done that wrong to us the chimes trotty's first excess of fear was gone but he had felt tenderly and gratefully toward the bells as you have seen and when he heard himself arraigned as one who had offended them so weightily his heart was touched with penitence and grief if you knew said trotty clasping his hands earnestly or perhaps you do know if you know how often you have kept me company how often you have cheered me up when i have been low how you were quite the plaything of my little daughter meg almost the only one she ever had when first her mother died and she and me were left alone you won't bear malice for a hasty word who hears in us the chimes one note bespeaking disregard or stern regard of any hope or joy or pain or sorrow of the many sorrowed throng who hears us make response to any creed that gauges human passions and affections as it gauges the amount of miserable food on which humanity may pine and wither does us wrong that wrong you have done us said the bell i have said trotty oh forgive me spare me cried trotty falling on his knees for mercy's sake listen said the shadow listen cried the other shadows listen said a clear and childlike voice which Trotty thought he recognized as having heard before. The organ sounded faintly in the church below. Swelling by degrees, the melody ascended to the roof and filled the choir and nave. Expanding more and more, it rose up, 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 higher, higher up, awakening agitated hearts within the burly piles of oak, the hollow bells, the iron-bound doors, the stairs of solid stone, until the tower walls were insufficient to contain it, and it soared into the sky. No wonder that an old man's breast could not contain a sound so vast and mighty. It broke from that weak prison in a rush of tears, and Trotty put his hands before his face. "'Listen,' said the shadow. "'Listen,' said the other shadows. Listen, said the child's voice. A solemn strain of blended voices rose into the tower. It was a very low and mournful strain, a dirge, and as he listened, Trotty heard his child among the singers. She is dead, exclaimed the old man. Meg is dead. Her spirit calls to me. I hear it. The spirit of your child bewails the dead, and mingles with the dead. Dead hopes, dead fancies, dead imaginings of youth, return the bell. But she is living. Learn from her life a living truth. Learn from the creature dearest to your heart how bad the bad are born. See every bud and leaf plucked one by one from off the fairest stem, and know how bare and wretched it may be, 
follow her to desperation each of the shadowy figures stretched its right arm forth and pointed downward the spirit of the chimes is your companion said the figure go it stands behind you trotty turned and saw the child the child will fern had carried in the street the child whom meg had watched but now asleep i carried her myself to-night said trotty in these arms show him what he calls himself said the dark figures one and all the tower opened at his feet he looked down and beheld his own form lying at the bottom on the outside crushed and motionless no more a living man cried trotty dead dead said the figures all together gracious heaven and the new year past said the figures what he cried shuddering i missed my way and coming on the outside of this tower in the dark fell down a year ago nine years ago replied the figures as they gave the answer they recalled their outstretched hands and where their figures had been there the bells were what are these he asked his guide if i am not mad what are these spirits of the bells their sound upon the air returned the child they take such shapes and occupations as the hopes and thoughts of mortals and the recollections they have stored up give them and you cried trotty wildly what are you hush hush returned the child look here in a poor mean room working at the same kind of embroidery which he had often often seen before meg his own dear daughter was presented to his view he made no effort to imprint kisses on her face he did not strive to clasp her to his loving heart he knew that such endearments were for him no more but he held his trembling breath and brushed away the blinding tears that he might look upon her that he might only see her ah changed changed the light of the clear eye how dimmed the bloom how faded from the cheek beautiful she was as she had ever been but hope 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 oh where was the fresh hope that had spoken to him like a voice she looked up from her work at a companion following her eyes the old man started back in the woman grown he recognized her at a glance in the long silken hair he saw the self-same curls around the lips the child's expression lingering still see in the eyes now turned inquiringly on meg there shone the very look that scanned those features when he brought her home then what was this beside him looking with awe into its face he saw a something reigning there a lofty something undefined and indistinct which made it hardly more than a remembrance of that child as yonder figure might be yet it was the same the same and wore the dress hark they were speaking meg said lillian hesitating how often you raise your head from your work to look at me are my looks so altered that they frighten you asked meg nay dear but you smile at that yourself why not smile when you look at me meg i do so do i not she answered smiling on her now you do said lillian but not usually when you think i'm busy and don't see you you look so anxious and so doubtful that i hardly like to raise my eyes there is little cause for smiling in this odd and toilsome life you were once so cheerful am i not now 
cried Meg, speaking in a tone of strange alarm and rising to embrace her. "'Do I make our weary life more weary to you, Lillian?' "'You have been the only thing that made it life,' said Lillian, fervently kissing her. "'Sometimes the only thing that made me care to live so, Meg. "'Such work, such work, so many hours, so many days, "'so many long, long nights of hopeless, cheerless, never-ending work. "'Not to heap up riches, not to live grandly and gaily, "'not to live upon enough, however coarse, but to earn bare bread, to scrape together just enough to toil upon, and want upon, and keep alive in us the consciousness of our odd fate. Oh, Meg, Meg! She raised her voice and twined her arms about her as she spoke like one in pain. How can the cruel world go round and bear to look upon such lives? Lily, said Meg, soothing her and putting back her hair from her wet face. Why, oh, Lily, you, so pretty and so young. Oh, Meg, she interrupted, holding her at arm's length and looking her in the face imploringly. The worst of all, the worst of all. Strike me, old Meg, wither me and shrivel me and free me from the dreadful thoughts that tempt me in my youth. Trotty turned to look upon his guide, but the spirit of the child had taken flight, was gone. End of section 14. Third quarter of the chimes.